So, I'm Barack. I'm a web developer from London, um, and I'm here to talk to you today about dynamic styles, or what I consider to be dynamic styles, I don't know if that's the right name, and how we can make serious things and cool things uh, with them, namely generative art, uh, but we'll keep that, we'll keep the best for last um, to keep you awake after lunch. So first off, uh, a bit of a content warning, uh, towards the end of the talk, the last demos are gonna be fast animations and audio. Um, I will say beforehand, so if that bothers you, you'll know when that's coming. The rest of the talk is completely static, so that's fine. Um, so a bit of uh, preface on how I got into generative art and why I try to do it with CSS. Uh, I had the pleasure of going to the Recurse Center in New York for those who, of you who are not familiar, formerly known as Hacker School. Um, it's basically a programming retreat for three months in New York. Um, that's a bit of a shameless plug. Uh, it's completely free of charge and it's people from all over the world coming around and playing with technologies just for the sake of having fun and exploring open source. Um, so it's not a startup accelerator or anything. If you're, it sounds cool, you can come and talk to me about it later. Um, but the kind of stuff that I was doing there is a lot of audio visual work, generative art, uh, exploring, you know, work with Canvas and JavaScript and P5 and open frameworks. Um, and I got really into audio visualization and video processing. Um, and what I noticed is that I'm always going towards the web tools that are WebGL and Canvas, and I'm never actually doing any art with CSS and HTML. Um, and that was my tool set before coming there. So towards the end of my time there, and recently I've tried to see how can I make uh, art with CSS? How can I create sort of dynamic experiences uh, with CSS? So what I was after was really dynamic styles. Um, and to give you sort of an explanation of what I mean by dynamic styles is how can I bridge the gap between JavaScript and CSS in a way that can be context aware and data driven and also like a normal API and not in a, in a way that felt hacky to me at least. Um, so, you know, how do we dynamic? What does that even mean? Let's, you know, start by looking at the, um, I guess, the bread and butter of CSS um, and the tools that we have um, in the CSS toolkit. And the first thing that I tried to use uh, was classes and you can, you know, recognize the bootstrap classes. And I tried to use classes as a tool to inject context into an application, into controlling sort of dynamic behavior. This is what we do with a class, right? Uh, you might recognize the, you know, the very ubiquitous bootstrap classes. Um, and what really goes on when we use a bootstrap class, right? We use a BTN success and a button turns from a normal button into a button that implies a positive thing, a success. We put a button error on a, a button warning, I forgot the name, um, on, a, on a button that becomes red and it implies danger. So we can use classes not just as a stylistic tool, but also as a tool of conveying context. And that context can change. If we remove a class, that context is gone. If we put a new class in, that meaning, the, the element gains new meaning. And we can do that on the fly with JavaScript. Um, that is not new. Um, but the main drawback of classes when trying to make uh, you know, things that are more dynamic or binding to values, not just something that's enumerable, is that it's really hard to handle number values or ranges. Because if I have, uh, for example, an audio range goes between uh, 2,500 to 25,000, I'm gonna have to need a class for every single uh, value along the way, or I'm gonna have to group things. And this is something that I didn't wanna do. So classes were sort of off the table as a tool for creating a really versatile dynamic experience. Um, the next weapon of choice that I tried to, you know, use was animations and transitions. Um, animations and transitions are sort of um, a step in the right direction because I can describe things over time. I can say when I, you know, apply a class, this stuff happens over this many seconds or an animation loop. And if I toggle classes on and off, maybe I'll be able to create uh, something that's pseudo-dynamic if I toggle the classes on and off at the right times. But that is very convoluted and it's very hard to create um, you know, visual, uh, visual experiences in the way that you plan them by toggling flags on and off everywhere. Um, so that was off the table um, as well. The third thing I try to do, and we talked about it today, it's very popular for, I guess, many people who work on a large scale front end project uh, today is to use extensions, and less SaaS, post CSS, uh, whatever it is. And they allow us, um, unlike regular CSS, to define expressions, right? We have variables, we have functions, we have a way of representing what we want to happen in forms of calculations and formulas, and that's really cool. That's much more powerful than, you know, just setting static classes and creating a lot of them. Um, so in here we can see we're using, we're mixing um, 
variables with units with 100% and I choose the number of columns in a page. It's very common, I'm sure, for uh, many of you. Uh, but there's, again, um, one drawback to this approach, and that is that at the end of the day, it's still compiled to regular CSS, so I can still generate 10,000 classes, but that's going to be very heavy and not very feasible. Um, and I'm still, at the end, limited to the, only to the classes that I generated. So binding to arbitrary values is still very difficult. Because, yeah, these are, you know, they are dynamic in the way that you write them, but they end up being static CSS files. Um, and before I ended up doing what we'll talk about, I tried another approach, and that is inline styles. Um, I'm not a huge fan of it. Um, in the current, in the type of work that I do, I know that inline styles are gaining more and more popularity now with things like React or React Native or, or Radium. But for the kind of use case that I was trying to use them for, for applying context to many different elements and many different um, attributes of styles for each element, um, it became very convoluted. Because um, let's look at even this small example. I want to make a perfect square, and I want it to be the size to be based of a parameter. I'm going to have to use that parameter twice and actually create the style string and apply it to an element to get the style that I want on the right. Um, so really, the case against inline styles became the fact that, first of all, I'm mixing presentation and application logic, which was a no-no for me because I didn't want actual CSS-specific stuff in my code. I wanted to just feed CSS values somehow um, and have them represented in my styles. So that was a no. Um, it's kind of difficult to handle uh, nested styles unless you're using a framework uh, like React or you know, Backbone or Angular, whatever it is that gives you access to elements easily. You have to start traversing the DOM and finding the elements that you want to update. Um, and also, values are not reusable. Like we saw in the, just the previous example with these two properties, I have to use the value twice to make it uh, work with two different properties. There's no easy way of reusing the variable. And if I generate a long string of text and I apply it and I do it very quickly, over uh, you know, uh, um, animation cycle, it can become very heavy and not very efficient um, when bridging between uh, dynamic things that are happening in the browser or in a loop and going back to CSS. So you know, that ended up not working. But we're done on talking about what not, what's not working. Let's see what is the method that I actually used to create dynamic styles. And we're going to do that with uh, three tools, uh, three features of CSS. The first is attributes. Second is calculations, and then variables or custom properties. Um, so just to get a feel, who used attributes before in any form? OK, cool, Every, almost everyone. Uh, calculations in CSS, cool. And custom properties, awesome. So for most of you, I think this will be familiar. And what I was hoping to get out of today is to get you to look maybe at these tools as more of an artistic uh, tool or a way of creating dynamic uh, styles, um, and we'll see how that works. So we'll start by talking about CSS attributes, and that is uh, mainly used in content today, in content of pseudo, pseudo elements. You're able to basically do this. You can get the text off an attribute, or the content off an attribute, and use it in CSS, in this case, in the content of a before, of a pseudo element. Um, and that gives us a lot of possibilities in you know, the realm of real world uh, web development before we get into uh, more um, artistic stuff. And I want to show you an example of how I used um, CSS attributes in, whoop, where's my mouse? I guess I'll just go to here, uh, here. A very simple example of how I use, use CSS attributes with dynamic values and how that can make your life easier when you're creating uh, you know, web applications. So you can see a few things going on on this page, cats around the world. Um, not very exciting. Where's my mouse again? Um, and you can see that uh, we're replacing text with emojis. Um, so how would you go about replacing text with emojis in a way that still respects accessibility and respects uh, the semantic uh, content in meaning of your, of your content? Uh, one way to go about it, um, which is uh, what I've done here, is that you can use text replacement in a way that still preserves the original meaning of the text. You can have an element, and that's just a span, and you can have the context, uh, context tech uh, cats in there. So the text is still there. Um, it, the span still contains the text. Uh, I don't know if you can see. The, um, yeah, there's a data replace tag here. And the value of the tag itself is the emoji that I want to use. So if I look at the after, I can have, oops. if I look at the after, I can see that I'm using an attribute with, a, um, with the data replace 
to have dynamic content injected into that element. So it's not just a string in the content, it's whatever I stick there will be replaced, uh, replacing the, uh, the, the content of the tag. So I'm still maintaining some kind of accessibility guideline. The text is still there, but it's replaced with an emoji. The other example, I'll zoom back out, is responsive content and not just responsive design. Um, if we look at this button with a lot of text in it, many, 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 many more cats, um, we make uh, if we look at the content of the button, you can see that this button has a data attribute called data responsive. Oh, I can actually push with the mouse. Data responsive. And that has a very uh, short string that just says more cats. And one use case for that is to, again, create responsive content that goes well with your responsive designs. So if I whoop, I'll scroll back out and I make this web page smaller, at some point, a media query will hide the content and will show the pseudo element and then able to have a button which is just smaller text. Another really good use case for this is for date pickers. If you have the full text going on big screens and you start making the screen small, often it will just break and you don't know what to do. And maybe in JavaScript, you'll run moment again or get a smaller string. You're able to just stick a smaller description and do all of the transition of responsive content with CSS. The third example, and that's a pretty straightforward example, is things like tooltips, where you hover over of the content and you can see the tooltip. Images usually have alt tags for screen readers or for when the image doesn't load. And one thing that you can do is use the content that's already in this alt tag to display a pseudo element on top of the image when it's hovered. It means that you can have another bit of functionality, another bit of context on that content without having more elements and more work um, in your templates and in your front end code. So that's a small example of what to do with attributes you know, in, in serious web development, and we can move on. Oops, sorry, back to the presentation. So the next thing is CSS calculations. Calculations that, are, um, as many of you said you've used before, uh, we can do um, in our actual CSS code and not just pre-processed. And what they allow us to do that's really powerful compared to calculations in, in pre-processed CSS whatever, with whatever framework you're using is that you're able to mix units on the fly and you can uh, create um, dynamic layouts with them. Also, it's cool to be able to describe you know, your styles in, in math, uh, but that's just a, a bonus. So the syntax is really as it is under, under the title. It's just calc and whatever your expression is in there. Uh, the powerful thing about calculations is that they are evaluated on the fly on, in the browser as the page loads. So that means that if you define a header and the height of the header is 100 pixels, um, you can define the calculation as being 100% of your page minus 100 pixels. And it doesn't matter what the size of your browser is, it will always reevaluate to 100% of that page minus 100 pixels. And that's very powerful when you're creating dynamic layouts that also have static elements in them. The next thing, um, and really the things that ties it all together, um, as we'll see soon, is CSS variables or custom properties. And this is the way they look. We've seen this dash dash in many places throughout the day. Um, and this is a pretty straightforward use case for, uh, for variables. We can set them up at the top of the page and we can reuse that variable anywhere we want in the page. Um, and that's really cool already to be able to create some kind of style guide for our page, right? We define this color in one place, just like bootstrap uh, variables in CES or LAS. And we can reuse them across our, our styles and we can replace that variable once and our whole style sheet changes. Um, so if I define this uh, header color, HC, as light blue, the color, uh, I can assign that variable to color of the content itself. And whatever I change it to, it will change back. And I only have to do it in one place. But the cool thing about uh, CSS variables is that they provide a really simple um, interface for bridging uh, JavaScript and uh, CSS. And what that looks like is provided that your variables are set on the root of the document on the top level of your entire, um, on, on the DOM, and this is where the variables are set, it's really easy to start manipulating them. Uh, it's basically a typical JavaScript getter or setter. You can get the property and you can set the property with a new value. And the beautiful thing about it is that once you set it in one place, it is available anywhere in the style sheet. So you have reusable variables native to CSS. Um, so I want to show you a quick example of that. Uh, you might have seen this page. It's the uh, Chrome, oop, before we go there. No more cats. 
It's the Chrome example of CSS variables. And you can see a few use cases for this already. Let's say you have a profile page on your application. You want to be able to allow users to customize the color of the profile page. Instead of creating 100 different classes for 100 different colors, you can just choose the color that you want to use, and the header will change. You only change the CSS variable they used here, um, a bunch of different CSS variables, and they show this entire example. But you can just change the variable once, and everything else changes, including the two different shades of the scholar, which is really cool, because you can start making, uh, combining variables and calculations to make different uses of the same variables that's only set once. Uh, another thing is, for example, setting the number of columns, and the layout will change automatically. Um, again, you don't have to have a particular class for every number of columns. It's just a number. Um, and the same goes for margin. So really, we found what we're looking for in terms of having a, a bridge of, oh, I need to go back to the presentation every time. We found what we're looking for in terms of a bridge between uh, JavaScript and CSS, a way to uh, reuse values that's coming from JavaScript. They're coming from your data, from your analysis, from whatever you're doing. You can feed them into CSS, and you can reuse them um, in different contexts, in different properties of style, in different units, all across your style sheet. Um, so this is what I wanted to show you in terms of just covering um, that range of CSS features, and now we can have some fun. Um, so the first thing I try to do is an example of using CSS variables uh, with some kind of video processing. Um, can't really see up there, but let's see. Examples and Oop. Okay, we'll start with this example, I guess. So this is the first example. This is how you can map audio data. Uh, what we're doing here is mapping um, the audio level, the audio level, and the actual the pitch detection of uh, tracks streaming from SoundCloud, and we're feeding that uh, audio level and pitch level, and we'll see the variables in a second into the style sheet. So all this is is uh, CSS gradients, and they're applied to the background, and we're manipulating the the gradient values for the background size when it repeats and the colors that are applied to the gradient itself to be able to, to create uh, styles that are responding to audio. And this is all done with you know a bit of JavaScript, but the visualization itself is driven by CSS. So this is one fairly simple example. Uh, where is the toolkit? I'm still zooming out. No. Oh, here we go. So this is one example with just the gradients. Another example is a bit more you know, visible in terms of seeing the audio. You can control a bunch of different things, not just the, um, the gradient, but also the size of elements, their speed of rotation. And you can compose visualizations that are really uh, cool visually, all by you know, combining different features of um, CSS dynamic behavior. So transitions and animations um, and the different colors. Um, and you can create experiences like this. Uh, the third example um, is also uh, incorporating sort of CSS um, 3D transforms. So we have this cube that's rotating and we have the backgrounds in the, the gradients in the background and we're creating sort of a kaleidoscope effect. Um, and we're also able to control the box shadow on the box, um, you know, to make it pump. So this is kind of cool, I think. I hope you think this is, you know, I, mean, I hope you like it. And I want to show you what that actually looks like in terms of the, um, in terms of the code that drives this. So we're gonna, Leave full screen for a second. Or I'm just going to go full screen from here. Here we go. Oh, now I can't see anything. Sorry. I'm going to find the file. I'm going to zoom in. Let's see. Is that big enough? Yeah, cool. So you can see that we're feeding the animations very, a very limited set of values. All we do is change the level, the level range, the pitch, and the pitch range. The ring is actually fixed, and we're not going to touch it. Um, the only reason we have the ranges is because there's no way of rounding values in CSS. And if you feed RGB uh, values that are not rounded, they're going to break. Um, 
But that is, you know, the whole thing, the whole m motion and the movement in the visualization is dr are driven by only two parameters. And this is what I was after. I was after changing a number in one place and using it in a bunch of different places. So you can see that we can already use these variables to create new variables for color levels. Um, and we can keep cascading the use of variables throughout our application. Um, so one example of what the gradients look like um, Let's say the one with the, with the square tiles is pretty crazy. Um, we're just reusing the same variables again and again, where basically instead of just using the, color, the named colors, I use them as variables and I can modify their HSL values. Uh, I think someone mentioned that before. Um, if you have uh, HSL colors and you're only modifying the hue, the colors seem to sort of look like they're from the same color palette and they're mixing around pretty well. Um, so this is what we're doing for the callers, and we can just stick these everywhere and sort of describe them the, the dynamic aspects of our styles and what do we want to move and what do we want to animate. And we can feed that from JavaScript very simply. Um, not, I'm going to drag this back here because I can't see which tab it is. But I want to show you the actual um, code for changing, for changing the values. So it's a very simple piece of code. We get uh, the audio source. And we, as, as the audio plays, we get the audio values. We r use uh, web audio analyzers. And setting only these two variables, and this is sort of an abstracted function, but what it does is basically set the property at the root level. Uh, we're just setting the pitch and the pitch range and the level and level range once in all of the styles that are affected by the variables, all of the calculations, all of the use of attributes, it's all re-evaluated. And you can see for yourself that um, the performance, even when rendering it, I think, um, it's an endless loop that renders all the time. You don't get lag, you don't get you know, weird performance issues because the CSS re-rendering, once you're working with the variable, the cascade of styles is fairly optimized and it's working really well. Um, so this is the first example I wanted to show you using audio. The other example I wanted to show you is using camera data. Um, and I'm gonna drag Chrome back here for a second because I can't see the URL. And then we'll get back to it. Okay, so this is the other example, and it's using two different values. One of them is actually just random numbers, uh, just random numbers uh, coming from JavaScript and fed, into a, um, and fed into the CSS. So you can see that the animation sort of repeats itself, right? It goes, you know, touching every corner and repeating. The actual movement of the squares is what's random, and the color of each block is actually coming from the camera, and I'm looking for the most dominant color, the most dominant color in the, in the frame, and I'm feeding that back into CSS. So I can play around and move my fingers in front of this thing and get some really interesting results. So half of the blocks are getting the, um, the uh, average color. The other half of the blocks is getting the inverted average color, and it can mess around, and this is all moving pretty well. Um, and this is all built with CSS. So you can mix around animations and transitions and 3D transforms and feed these values uh, at the top level of your application and really make everything respond to these values. Um, and yeah, this is what I wanted to show you today. Generative art with CSS. Hope you liked it. Um, thank you. <laughs>